A note to listeners, Straight Up Care and Reduce the Stigma intentionally avoids stigmatizing language. However, we do not censor the language of individuals with lived and living experience. We respect their right to use the words they prefer. Welcome to Reduce the Stigma, brought to you by Straight Up Care. Today we have an episode of Recovery Conversations, a series that raises up the voices of those with lived and living experience, as well as the people and organizations supporting them. Adam, thank you so much for being with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this. I'm excited. Uh oh, your what? webcam went all the way to the side. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I'm excited to uh, talk with you. I, I've heard a little bit about F5 and uh, Ridge uh, Treatment and Reentry Center, and I got a glimpse of your background, but. Uh, I think it's just amazing to hear what you're doing. And so if you don't mind, can you just kind of introduce yourself? Yeah. So my name is Adam Martin. I don't know why I keep doing that. I'm going to switch cameras um, okay. if I can. Uh, but my name is Adam Martin. I am uh, the founder and executive director of the F5 project. I can't switch it. Um, okay. And uh I started that probably back in two, 2016 unofficially before we were actually a business. And I was doing tech sales for a networking company here in Fargo. And I got asked to speak at this United Way event. And by the time I got off um, the stage, a kind of flickered this like or a fan to flame this this spark that was inside me to like help people. And uh, I had more emails from people reaching out to me, you know, for like peer support stuff or guidance for parents or youth and you know stuff like that. And uh, I think I lasted for about four months. Um, by the time I uh, left and went and started at five and I, and all that was there was no business plan. <clears throat> there was no um, uh, there was no uh, uh, real motive or agenda. I don't know why it keeps sliding that way. It's so weird. <laughs> um, and but it was uh, it was it, I, my heart was in it, and I just started going to the jails and talking to guys, um, and it found out real quick uh, what was needed, which was housing. And so we became a legit business in January 2018 or 17, sorry, and uh, opened up our first house in April 2017. And uh, now today we have over 100 employees um, between the Ridge and F5, which I, uh, the Ridge I started uh, a little over a year ago. Um, and we have multiple transitional apartment units and a youth program, a Native American trauma healing program, and a bunch of other stuff. So it's just, it really just kind of took a life of itself and became um, probably the fastest growing nonprofit. And I don't know how far, you know, but definitely in the Midwest. Um, and so that's kind of who I am. My background is, is that I'm a five-time felon and I got sober back in 2013. Um, and I, that was after years and years and years, I was 31 when I got sober, um, and I had been going to recovery meetings or treatment or detox or, you know, whatever, you know, from 2000 until 2013. Um, so I was kind of known as like a chronic slipper, uh, relapser, uh, never really got more than three months. Of sobriety, and uh, and then 2013, it just all clicked, and I finally stayed sober and had a purpose, um, which was to help others. Uh, but that purpose wasn't, like I said, didn't really um, take off until 2016. 
And rewinding back to that that stage at the United Way, I think you said it was, your story, I imagine, that or what you were speaking about uh, was your recovery experience. Um, and is that the first time that you had, had shared it? Or what do you think it was that was the, the catalyst for that fire to be ignited? Yeah. So I did look in the settings. It will not let me switch while we're recording. So that's why we're going to have to deal with whatever craziness is going on. Um, so did you, the question was, is what inspired it? Is that what you asked? Uh, what was it that uh, that time that whether it was your first time speaking <laughs> or just something oh. that was what was different that time? It wasn't uh, so much that. Um, it was the first time uh, speaking as it was the first time speaking in front of like professional people. Um, okay. And so, you know, I had been part of the 12-step group for a long time and spoke quite a bit, you know, between meetings and conferences and stuff like that. Um, not real big ones, but, you know, kind of small and medium and, and had a lot of different um, roles within that community as well. Uh, when I spoke, when I, I guess it was the first time that I really like kind of broke my, my anonymity, if you will, is when mm -hmm. kind of, I never really said where I belonged to, but I did say that I was in recovery. Um, <clears throat> and I think what it was, was it was the first time that, uh, that my community had, um, put a face to like homelessness, addiction, recovery. There was never really a face as much as there was um, like, they knew that there was like a problem, um, but they didn't really know anybody who had had any kind of success, right? And so mm -hmm. most people, you know, defined what they, um, what they thought with addiction or recovery or whatever based off personal experiences with like family members or whatever and so when i came to the scene it was i don't think it was anything really special as much as i was the first you know what i mean so it okay. was like um it was the first time that i think someone like a like an organization had put something on and and really spotlighted that this person was in recovery you know what I mean? It was it was the yeah. first time that I think that they put the microphone down and gave it to someone else and let them tell their own story rather than them just making it a, an agenda on the mayor's like blue ribbon commission or something. You know, so right. I think that's probably what made it special um, is that it was the first time that a peer support actually got to talk. That that's amazing. Uh, I'm a licensed professional counselor and I go to conferences, continuing education, and it is so rare that the person that we get to hear from is a person with lived experience. Um, yeah. And we can, let's pause and we can end this and re-record so you can switch the uh, camera if that would be easy. It's good. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so that that's just wonderful that you were given that opportunity, which it should be more people with lived experience than just degree professionals who've studied it. Um, so that that's so great to hear. And hopefully they uh, saw the value and kept doing it. So F5 started in a way in that on that day. And it has it's an interesting name. Can you tell me what does F5 represent? Yeah. Um, so originally what it stood for was, I was trying to, I mean, I was trying to come up with something clever about having five felonies on my background and then doing something. I mean, I didn't even know how big we were going to get, but just something cool. Right. And mm -hmm. so I was just, I was in the shower, just like obsessing about me because I knew, I knew from the experience of working in the tech sector and and seeing people start businesses that branding was like very important and i come from a sales and marketing background and so i was trying to keep it as simple as I so i was thinking like force five or like something like like superman kind of logo you know just i don't know it was kind of cheesy but um 
And then it just popped in my head, F5 uh, project. And so the first thing I did is I told, um, I told my friends about it, that that was what I was going to name it. And then I went to, and then before I told them, I checked the domain registry and it was available. And I was like, this is, this is a dream come true. And so I told a couple of buddies about it. And then I told some you know people on Facebook about it. And then I went back like 10 minutes later to buy the domain and it had been bought up. And I was like, oh. what? Like it was all perfect right until that moment. And I was like, there's no way someone had to, do, you know. And so then as I'm like trying to figure out a different name and all that, my buddy messaged me and he was like, how's the domain search coming? And I was like, <laughs> you did it, you know. And he was like, yeah, next time buy it before you tell people about it, you know. And so um, he uh, he was also in recovery. He's a cybersecurity specialist, you know, all that stuff. So he uh, I gave him a dollar and he gave it to me. So, um, but yeah, so then I got to speaking and I, the governor appointed me to the Recovery Reinvented Advisory Council. And when he introduced me, he's he, kind of changed the narrative of what the name meant by accident. And what he said is that it was the F5 key on the keyboard, which when you hit that, it refreshes the screen. And he's like, and what Adam's doing is, is giving people a second chance, kind of like hitting that F5 key and seeing them as if they never had any criminal record, you know? And so, wow. Yeah, so it's kind of a double entendre of like, five felonies and then the refresh cube. That's such, such a great story. And also quite the lesson learned about uh, branding <laughs> yeah. and domain <laughs> management. Yeah. yeah. Don't tell anyone until you own that. Um, and so the five felonies, that is cr like the central kind of building block of F5, <laughs> your experience, but also the people being served. Uh, it, it's all about, or at least a significant component, as I understand, is about helping those people who've been incarcerated while they're incarcerated, after incarceration, just really setting them up for success. Can, can you speak about some of the challenges that are often faced that you're able to, to address? Yeah, I think that there's, well, let, I'll say like strategy wise, it made sense for me to stay kind of home in my world, you know, to, to help, you know, being justice impacted and locked up and from foster homes to juvenile detention to jails to, you know, everything. Um, it made sense, number one, because that's my lived experience. Number two, people with felony backgrounds seem to be the center point of interest of every demographic group, right? So it's like um, not only every demographic group, but like every point of barrier within systems, right? So most people who have felony backgrounds also have CPS cases, right? They also mm -hmm. uh, are, there's a good chance that they're probably unemployed. There was also that they might be homeless, all because of their felony background, which is a direct result of their addiction, right? And so, you know, every direction that you look, there's a chance that someone with a felony background or who's injustice impacted is, is somewhere in the mix, even to the point of, of parks and recreation where people sleeping in there on the benches there probably are justice impacted. So it made right. sense, you know, from a logistics standpoint that that's what we need to focus on. Um, and so we knew, we knew, learned real quick that there, that there's a lot more barriers for addicts and alcoholics who have justice involvement than it is without. Right. And so we wanted to specialize on that because that's what our experience was. And, uh, um, and so far, I mean, it's been, it's been amazing. Like our houses are 100%. Um, they're not sober living as much as they're transitional units for people who have felony backgrounds. So there may be people who come and live with us that may not identify as having, uh, you know, a substance use disorder or, or, an addict or an alcohol, whatever you know, they choose to call themselves. Um, uh, but, there, but there is a good chance, right, that they will be. Right. Um, and so we do make our houses about recovery, about reentry, about reform, uh, about rehabilitation. Um, 
And, and if there's someone who comes through there that doesn't happen to identify, they still participate and still end up living a better life had, had they not gone through it, you know? So, uh, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a wild ride. You know, I, I honestly thought that I was going to be in the tech field for the rest of my life and I just couldn't deny, I just got really obsessed with reentry. Um, yeah. and the barriers and the pitfalls of, of employers not hiring people who are justice involved to housing, you know, companies not renting to them or charging them application fees, even though they know they're going to deny them to mugshot right. reform. I'm really, really big on digital media and the, the, the life sentence it creates for people who have committed even the most minimalistic felonies. You know, a very, very low key drug possession didn't deal what had no intentions of dealing is just trying to like stay mentally alive and they get a mugshot and it lives on the internet forever. Even if they get pardoned or expunged or have the record sealed or anything like that, uh, there's no checks and balances when it comes to the internet and the stigma that it creates for our people. It, you know, that that's. Oof. So many, so many interesting things you just said, um, and individuals returning to the community, you know, there's this idea of a sentence that you're going to serve your time, but the punishment, uh, which is, you know, what it's, it's supposed to be a punishment, which let's, I can save that for another day of discussion. Uh, uh, but it follows the person because like you said, there's, there are going to be limited housing opportunities, employment opportunities, and we're not setting people up for success, how the, how the system currently works. If anything, we're setting them up for failure to, you know, reoffend, to go right back in. And you're providing solutions that are go is going to stop that cycle. And there aren't many programs out there because a lot of times it's, it's too hard. So yeah. that I just applaud you for on what is really difficult it is, you know, there's a lot of systemic barriers out there. Yeah, I agree with that a hundred percent. And I, and I know it from experience because I've lived in it, you know, I've been in halfway else in these transitional uh, centers to, uh, to nothing, you know, standing in a jail lobby, wondering where I'm going to go, you know, to staying in a homeless shelter to to, to sitting out in the, ho the homeless shelter lobby, wait, wondering if I'm going to get a bed. Like I, and I'll tell you the one thing that really pissed me off about all of it was just the, the customer service, right? I come from the for-profit arena and customer service and culture are always the most important aspects of any company, right? Treat your people well mm -hmm. and they'll treat people better, right? And uh, man, I, I think it was like a combination of nonprofit burnout, like service providing burnout to like this hierarchy of like, you know, like you need me, you know, to, to, to become successful, mm -hmm. you know, you need right. the bed that I'm going to provide or you need the whatever. And I just, I was really turned off about like how people in the nonprofit world, like, tend to treat people that, that would be considered customers in other arenas. Right. And so, yeah. you know, all the staff here, uh, or team, as I like to call them, all of our team here and all the other offices, like it is preached from the very beginning that no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And if you care about people, they will change. And I have, yeah. if there's any toxicity, if there's any mm -hmm. gossip, if there's any, uh, any kind of like just bad relations when it comes to clients or customers or whatever, but we cut that fat immediately because it, the people who are coming to us should be treated like they are the bloodline to the success of the nonprofit. If we're, and if they're not successful, we're not successful. And I didn't want to build a company that was built on inputs and outputs. I wanted to build it on quality of care. And, um, in the successful living of the people that we provide services to. And so out of all the people that come and live in our houses, we have like a 75% a uh, success rate um, of, wow. of 
Right. Like all, I mean, let me take that back. We have a 75% success rate of people completing our program statewide. So that includes housing, it includes peer support, it includes care coordination, like all of that. And so uh, 25% go back to prison or they abscond or they quit services or whatever. Um, and so, uh, and, that, and those stats are backed up by the state because the state is keeping track of our, of all mm -hmm. the stuff, all the people that we're working with. And that's what it's showing is in the last five years, it's like 75%, which is, that's the polar opposite of the national average of people who actually go back to prison is 75%. Yeah. I mean, that is a remarkable outcome. That, that is stunning. Uh, yeah. And I'll tell you the secret sauce, Whitney, is that the people who are doing the work are the peer supports. And so they're out in the community and they're going to meetings with people. They're bringing them to church. They're giving them rides to meet with probation. They're making sure their calendars are up to date. Like they are like the real peer support. They're not going in from an authoritarian or like a sponsor or like, a, right. like, a, which is, there's nothing wrong with like, I have a sponsor, but like he, his role and peer support roles are drastically different. And, you know, Early in my recovery, there was two guys that I could accredit everything to, to where I'm at today. My sponsor or my mentor, whatever you want to call him, and my go-to buddy. And my mm -hmm. go-to buddy was the guy that I knew that when shit hit the fan and I called him at two o'clock in the morning, he was going to answer and he was not going to be judgy. My sponsor was not put in that position. He's not the guy that I'm going to call at two o'clock in the morning. He's not the guy I'm going to hang out with. He's really just a guy, right? I'm too, you know, he's 25 years sober. He's got a lot of things going on in his life and he's helping me navigate to get to that point. My buddy, right? My peer support, if you will, is the guy that's like going to meetings with me. He's going to movies with me. We're drinking coffee until four o'clock in the morning kind of guy, you know, like where he's like my ride or die, you know? Yeah. And so when we built out F5, it was not built out on being like, you know, sponsors. It was meant for authoritarian or guides, if you will. We have them, uh, but it was built out on like, like having a bunch of rider dies in your life that are, that no matter what happens, whether you overdose or you successfully get your family back, like, you know, everywhere in between, that peer support's riding with you. That's amazing. And, and just, you know, the employment opportunities, then you're also offering the people that you're serving, um, the ability to use that lived experience as an asset, as a valued asset, even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're the best. I mean, they're the, they're the heartbeat of this organization because we have, you know, the executive leadership team, we have regional directors, we have care coordinators, we've got peer supports. Right. And at the end of the day, like I hear stories all the time from the peer supports on going into people's homes and helping pulling them out and getting them into treatment to, uh, you know, having people show up that were like contemplating suicide and show up to the office and hang out with three, four peer supports and just make sure that she's good before she leaves. You know, like it is all sorts of stuff. Um, we're, we're getting calls to come and help them empty out their alcohol or get rid of their dope or whatever the case may be. Like we travel on packs and I think, you know, the, the solution is proximity, right? And so mm -hmm. the closer you are to the proximity of peer supports, the increases of your recovery will be long standing. So the, you know, my sponsor used to give this talk that, you know, depending on where you're at, when shit hits the fan, right? If you're on the center of the table, it's a lot harder to fall off, right? So centralize yeah. yourself or get within the proximity of your community and whatever you're doing the most, wherever your attention is the most, when shit hits the fan, that's probably what you're going to do more of, right? Yeah. And so we really push like, Come to our events, come hang out at the office, you know, get connected with other peer supports, go to 12 step meetings, do like 
Like your whole life, it should just be a job. Your recovery should be like, feel like it is like eight hours a day of just doing stuff, whether it's practicing principles to actually hanging out with your supports to going to be like, uh, cause our life depends on a hundred percent. Right. You know, everything that I have today is, is 100% contributed to, to me making that phone call on day one. There's so much to be said about the little things. I hate to use that term, but you know, like when something goes wrong in the day, being someone being there, just like talk, talk to you, you know, be alongside you. Cause a lot of like funding goes to the big stuff, right? The, the yeah. medication, the treat, like the formal treatment. And that's understandable. That's great. That's important. It's not everything though. It doesn't address all the needs of the person. And it's those little things that can be what build up to cause someone to have a slip, like you, you mentioned, you know, and, and whenever there's, you have, you like build that system, you have that, that group, the people who are going to be there for the big and the little, that's when, when you're going to see so much more progress and, and eagerness, because it doesn't seem as daunting when you have people alongside, uh, alongside you. Yeah. hundred percent. The enthusiasm is very addictive. And so you know, the more enthusiastic our peers are when they're around, you know, enthusiastic for change, enthusiastic for being open-minded, the willingness, like, the more it just kind of, it just, it becomes, like, you consume it, right? It can becomes contagious. Uh, it's the same with our work, right? Like, if people show up and they're being toxic, that toxicity is going to be contagious, right? Yeah. It just, negative people create negative people and positive people create positive people. You know, and there's obviously anomalies to that, but, you know, uh, in a general sense, most PA people react the same way, you know. And so if you treat them like you care, um, especially justice impacted people, uh, they will they will eventually find their way. And that's all. Yeah. I think that's our only goal is is to plant seeds and hopefully one day they will eventually find their way. Absolutely. Uh, so I actually used to work in a jail. I ran the substance use programs. And what my personal goal was, was always to be the different type of staff member in the jail. The one that didn't talk down, didn't say, like, use power and authority over and instead build the person up. And that yeah. that is what I hear from you is that. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't recognize, especially on the reentry like side, is that people are coming from a very, very hostile environment. It is a tra traumatic experience, and they're having to transition into a community that maybe they've been out of for decades. That's a lot, and we we kind of just like overlook it, it at society at large and say, you know what? Hey, you're out now. You should be pulling yourself up by your bootstraps kind of thing. But there are so many things that, that we should be doing for, for these person, these people and uh, helping them and eliminating barriers. Uh, and it, it sounds like that's what you're doing uh, through F5 with the housing, with employment, um, you know, just a very comprehensive, holistic, you know, model uh, and then you have, if we can just quickly touch on Ridge Treatment and Reentry Center, what what is that offering to the community? So I was approached by Dr. Jackie Gervais about creating something. And she was coming from a very large treatment center, quite a large in North Dakota. She was the chief nursing officer at the time. And the reason why she she knew that peer support was by far the most overlooked and misunderstood aspect of treatment, right? And there's and I know some CEOs of treatment centers that have tried to implement peer support, um, and they've all failed, right? And and I personally think that the reason that we've had so much success and why Jackie reached out to me was because it was peers being led by peers, right? And so when you put, like, I'm literally probably the most unequipped person to ever be a CEO. I have a G, like from a, from a, 
from a typical standpoint, right? Or the stereotypical. Um, right. I have a GED, I got a bunch of felonies. I have never done business before outside of sales and marketing, like direct sales and marketing. I've never did business development. I've never done contracts or grant writing or what any of this. Um, but I, there's a secret sauce about being a peer, supporting a peer, right? Or uh, being a peer support, supporting a peer, or just in general, just a group of people that all want to do better than they did yesterday. Being led by people who are just like them and not some kind of suit, right? Yeah. Uh, or a legislator or some kind of director, whatever the case may be. Um, and so she had seen what I accomplished with that five. And I think at the time when we were talking about starting the ridge, I had probably 40 employees at the time and they were, we were pumping out awesome outcomes. And so the missing piece, like the piece for me was that I wish that we could, I always wanted to start a treatment center because my one regret was with going the route that we went is that I wish I could spend more time with people. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, when she, when we started the, the treatment center, it was outpatient treatment and I got to spend like nine hours a week instead of just maybe an hour, right? If with guys, um, and man, it was like, it just, as soon as that first group came through and they went out and told people about it and probation officers were seeing the outcomes and stuff, it just blew up. And we, yeah. in the last year, we went from like three employees to like 30 in a year, you know? Um, That's incredible. And so we got multiple groups, domestic violence groups, uh, relapse prevention, trauma-informed wow. care groups. Like, like it, is, it is by far the most holistic in the sense of addiction counselor and peer support-led um, focus groups that I've ever been a part of. There's a peer support in every single hour of group. How, all right, we, how do we get your model across the nation? Like that is <laughs> yeah. what needs to happen. I, and uh, I, I hope it happens. Like you, you have something magical there, which obviously the outcomes are showing it. And yet yeah. <laughs> we keep doing this like forcing authoritarian model. Um, and I'm saying that as someone who was part of the system and it doesn't work. It, 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 I mean, it can work in a way, but it's not going to have that long lasting impact. Uh, mm -hmm. Man, well, that's just I mean, really, incredible. Yeah, what it really comes down to, Whitney, is that um, we've been telling people who struggle with alcoholism or addiction or, you know, whatever the, the, the drug is. Um, for a long time, we've been telling them that doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result is a form of insanity. What I can say right. is that I, 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 I say that to our government and I say that to our legislators yeah. and I say that to our state workers and that we, we've been funding certain areas for a very long time that we don't even question it anymore. Yeah. Right. Like, right. why aren't we pump, why aren't we asking treatment yeah. uh, providers to provide recidivism results? How many times right. does somebody have to go to treatment before, you know, before we start asking questions? You know, if somebody goes back to prison within a year, they're like, holy cow, we need to change something, you know? Yeah. And so why aren't we yeah. doing that with treatment? Why aren't we doing that with detox and, and homeless shelters? And because all of their income is based off inputs. It's not based right. off loans, right? No. If I do it's check support, the boxes. They just check the boxes. They they don't have to do anything different because because they're getting funded for mediocrity. You know. Yeah. So and with peer support, like our programs, we're funded through performance. So if if somebody if we're able to check the boxes in a different way, if we're able to check the box that this person got connected to recovery and he's maintaining, this is what he's been doing for the last week before his recovery. Uh, he's employed, we help him get his job. This is what he's doing to maintain his job. Uh, and then housing, like we got him housed. And so basically all of our, all of our outcomes are 
based on the actual outcomes of what recovery looks like. And so we're paid yeah. on wellness and we don't, we get reimbursed for it. So we got to put in the work first and then they reimburse us for the outcome of those boxes and every box that's not checked, we don't get paid. You know what I mean? And, so it's and that's tiered out. Hundred percent. Yeah, it's a perfect plan. And that's the problem. You're doing things like you're you're taking a risk by doing it before the payment, and that's what's stopping every innovation from going into play. Is because treatment centers, you know, corporate entities don't want to put the money first to be able to say it's going to work. You know, it's oh well, you know, yeah, it may save me money down the road or bring in more money, but it's going to cost something up front. Well, that you've got to do that, and then it'll happen. And so, that's great that you took that risk because that's not something that most facilities are willing to do. Yeah, well, that's they're they're still not. We've been doing it for seven years, and we <laughs> the only people that have hired peers are are peer support organizations, a couple smaller treatment centers, um, and then I mean that's it. All the big yeah. dogs, all the like the hospitals, like they're they'll they'll maybe contract for a little bit, but even then they it's the first to go, you know. Right. And we have evidence yeah. that shows that peer support models are have way better outcomes than than these big dogs are doing with their institutions and they still are funding them. And the only time they don't get the, the money or whatever is if somebody doesn't show up. We don't get paid if they don't perform. Right. They could show up every day and we'll get a base pay because they didn't increase their housing, they didn't increase their employment, they didn't increase their recovery. And so the only time we get a performance pay on all those is if there's an increase from the month before. They're going to a meeting and maybe they're not housed yet, but they're looking, you know, there's got to be, there has to be momentum for us to get paid off. Can I do a call to all people who are involved in value-based payment reform? This is what value-based payment is about. It's about the person being able to accomplish the things that they need, not about, yeah. oh, we've retained them for 60 days or whatever. Like It's about what does the person need and are they getting it? That is value-based. Oh, yeah. I love it. I think it was perfect. It. For, it was a perfect storm for me, Whitney, because I came from the sales arena. And I 100% get the concept of compensation based on performance to the point where it's like no salary. It's only performance you get paid on. And that doesn't freak me out. But most people, it's because they just, they're not grinders. They're not hustlers. They're not, you know, they're not built in the, in the, I mean, used to sell drugs and steal cars and sell parts and stuff. Like my whole life has been built off performance, you know? And so when this all came together, it, there's a reason that that we became successful, you know, with what we're doing very fast because we were passionate and because we're a bunch of ex truck dealers and, and hustlers and you know whatever. We we built up the lived experience of being able to knock on doors and ask questions, you know. And the creativity and the willingness to work hard i i get it it maybe didn't always fall within like the legal boundaries it's not easy to be someone who has an addiction or is homeless you are constantly having to survive and figure out where you're getting food from where you're sleeping you know who you can trust who you can't trust that takes a lot and that's you know you can apply that in those other areas i mean like you said you never thought you don't meet the stereotypical ceo but you're killing it as CEO. And we got to stop looking at these lived experiences as, oh, bad on you. And instead be like, okay, now how do we use those strengths for you to be Mm. successful within the legal boundaries? Maybe it is, or what have you. And let's stop like putting people down because they have these incredible talents. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the closest that a, in the professional world that someone could ever feel like what it's what it feels like to be you know someone who struggled with addiction or homeless or whatever is a ceo because the stress of of especially a, a one that's like medium-sized to large 
because of all the stress of like the financials, the, you know, the personnel, the, the worst case scenarios, families not thinking you're spending enough time with them, you know, like you're just constantly right. stressed mentally in every direction. And the only other time that I ever felt like that is when I was addicted to drugs and I was homeless. That's the only wow. time the stress levels may be, I mean, the, the, the wow. reasons are different, but my body doesn't know the difference. The yeah. stress factor, the, my, the threat response that I get from, from not being at like wondering if I'm going to make payroll, right. Hypothetically mm -hmm. is the same as if I, if, if I'm about to be evicted from my apartment, my body reacts to it the same way. You know, so when you have those kinds of conversations and and you and you and you create the narrative for a CEO to understand or a lawyer to understand or whatever, when it's broke down like that, they're a lot more um, a lot more willing to hear you out because they understand not making payroll. And when you bring that world together as like not being able to to pay rent and you and your kids might be homeless, that makes yeah. sense to them. You know, and then they become really big advocates for you, especially if you send them uh, people who are going to work their asses off for them. You know, so it's a, right. it's a community effort. Employers need employees. You know, landlords need people to rent out their properties. Uh, people in recovery love getting new people into the recovery, right? Like it's the center point yeah. of interest of creating holistic change between every department every agency every nonprofit, and every family i i mean there's there's nothing else to say you just like captured <laughs> this amazing like wow i my head is spinning i have really enjoyed talking with you adam and i keep going on um so hopefully we can reconnect again sometime uh and get an update on f5 and and the ridge yeah. and and clearly your passion and advocacy for individuals who've been incarcerated peers just changing the system to be better um how can people connect with you what's how do they contact f5 the ridge where where all are you for them to reach out yeah so our probably the two points are our our website so f5 like the letter f the number five the word project.org and then uh ridge uh with an r Ridge ND as in NorthDakota.org. Great. And you also yeah. have a podcast, the F5 Project Recovery Podcast. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to put that fun. link in our details, uh, our show notes, so that people can find it. Um, just incredible. Uh, thank you yeah. so much for what you're doing. It's wonderful. I appreciate that. And then, you know, uh, I don't know how many of your listeners are from the South Dakota uh, area or whatever, but we'll be. F5 will be in uh, Sioux Falls on March 12th doing a lunch and learn. Um, oh, wow. uh, Basically talking to, you know, the community and listening to the needs and seeing if there's a way that we can start up an F5 in Sioux Falls. That would be incredible. All right. Well, yeah. we'll pass along info because we definitely yeah. have people. We have a lot of people in South Dakota. So uh, who listen, cool. who are part of straight up care. So let's, you know, there's, we can, we can, all these organizations, we can all work together. Um, sure. No need to, to see it as competition. It's about, there's a lot of people out there in need and we can work together to serve everyone. Yeah. My biggest competition is who I was yesterday. It's not ah, anyone else. That's, that's great. Well, well, thank you so much, Adam, for joining. Appreciate it. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please join us on our mission to reduce the stigma by liking, sharing, and leaving us a review. You can watch our full episodes on our Amazon Fire and Roku TV channels, as well as at ReduceTheStigma.com. Reduce the Stigma is hosted by me, Whitney Minarchek, edited by Sarah Elash, and music by Audiosphere. This has been a Straight Up Care production.